a distinguished chairperson, uh, my general uh, participants, and friends. Well, I'm really privileged at this opportunity of speaking this uh, in this panel, and uh, I will try to share some thoughts on the three words actually uh, which has been uh, brought up in this plenary session on academics, industry and government and uh, perhaps share my views, my humble views uh, on, uh, on the interactions. Uh, I need to make an honest confession at the very beginning of this discussion. I have not been trained as a diaspora scholar. My original area of research has been business history. In the process of doing my research and writing about Indian business communities in Singapore, which has been published in 2011, my interest in knowing and learning about this very dynamic diaspora group. Today, my comments and inferences will be based on my own area of research. Uh, the very idea of addressing academics, industry and government in terms of intersectoral relations and challenges is, according to me, a very uh, a significant step forward in the onward journey of making a more meaningful and comprehensive approach to the study of diaspora. The correlation has perhaps been already recognized, but not much has been done to promote their interactions. Uh, one perhaps then needs to direct attention to what really has been achieved in this respect, <coughs> like examining the success and failures of policies and programs, um, the, what are the emerging benefits arising out of this collaboration, and what perhaps needs to be achieved in the path of future progress um, in, in terms of building capacities and reducing barriers between these pillars. And we can then perhaps talk about some important points like institutional linkages, engagement of the diaspora, training in original countries to adapt to destinations, um, country standards, you know, and, and that, is, that is specific. I have a, a specific thing in mind which is about, about avoiding waste of human capital in the process of relocation and migration. And also bringing about foreign education and training institutions. Well, I think many of these points have already been discussed in many of the panels that we have already gone through in, in the last few <coughs> days. Skill migration, one of the most popular trends of contemporary migration, has brought about widely acknowledged benefits both for destination countries, migrants themselves, and also to the home countries. Though there has been a growing academic consensus that home countries can benefit from the circulation of skills, it is yet a challenge to enable a full exploitation of this potential. Diasporas have been increasingly considered in government development policy initiatives. They have been playing important roles in FDI, foreign direct investments, remittances, philanthropy, and we've seen all these, we have discussed all these in the past two days, capital market investments, human capital transfer, development of tourism, to mention some of the areas. Uh, in building up a constructive relationship with the diaspora, one needs to inquire and analyze whether appropriate policy measures have been undertaken in each of the above mentioned aspects to ensure smooth flow of diasporic mobilities and the awareness within the diaspora of the initiatives already in place. The role of academia at this juncture then becomes crucial in providing with the necessary research, feedback, inputs and analysis into to build up the necessary discourse. We have often talked about flows of human capital resources and, and that kind of refers to the flexibility of the liquid, true to it, the properties of the liquid, of a liquid state of matter. Migrant flows, though initially structured under registered and uh, regulatory and legislative frameworks, often meanders and assumes a momentum of its own. An important example can be my own area of research in the Indian diaspora in Singapore, where positive bilateral political G2G engagements starting in the 1990s took the culmination of the Comprehensive Economic Agreement, uh, Cooperative Agreement or SICA, as is popularly known as, in 2005. SICA facilitated the flow of 127 categories of professionals and skilled workers into Singapore, which was a landmark achievement of the Lucas policy of India. Perhaps uh, we are differing there here from Professor there, and we can discuss that later. As well as that of Singapore, which was signing such an agreement for the first time with any of the states in South Asia. Uh, however, 
Over the next two decades, the migration flows of Indians have achieved such enormous proportions that might not be have been envisaged by the respective political leaders two or more decades before. I mean, this is only my assumption. Perhaps they had also foreseen this future. There are about 6,000 Indian companies in Singapore. It is the largest foreign business sector in the state. Number of permanent residents have increased. Number of Indian international schools for primary and secondary education have emerged. And uh, suggesting the movement of professionals and entrepreneurs with their families now. Even in the tourism sector, Indian tourists are the highest source of tourism GDP earnings for Singapore, are the second highest uh, tourism GDP earnings for Singapore. Their production of knowledge is perhaps being incorporated in the policy decisions and initiatives. However, their agency is either not prominent enough or missing in the action. In Singapore, there are various migration clusters. Uh, there's a migration cluster within the National University of Singapore, which works on various issues of migration studies in Southeast Asia and beyond. However, Indian diasporic movement has not been a part of the major dimension of the discourse. Though some work has been done on laboring migrants. The other universities, for example, SMU, that is Singapore Management University, has taken up India's studies from business perspectives and development, uh, thus creating case studies and or collaborating with the, in the various Indian IITs. Um, the Institute of South Asian Studies, under the umbrella of, again, NUS, has been perhaps the only research institute to take up the role of addressing different issues in the diaspora from time to time. And uh, the, the most important example could be the, uh, the South Asian Diaspora Convention, uh, which is a prominent step in that direction. From the Indian perspective, as far as my knowledge grows, and please forgive me if I'm wrong here and do correct me in the course of our discussion, no major work has been undertaken to look into various perspectives of the Indian diaspora in Southeast Asia. Academic researchers have prioritized other nation states over Singapore in spite of the flow, again I come back to the flow of mobilities and the growing imagination of Singapore as a destination for students, entrepreneurs, professionals, tourists, etc. There is thus a major disconnect between what has been done and what can be achieved. Developing a roadmap for a sustainable and effective engagement between the academia, industry and government could be a significant step and platforms like this conference can be the torchbearer of promoting such interactions. Thank you very much.